problems and we wonder why, you know, and how come. And But, you know, we need to trust in God. Amen. And, and you know what? You can trust in God this morning. Uh, this morning, I want to ask you to pray for, for my wife's family. Amen. Uh, for the family of uh, uh, George, Sonia, amen, and David, amen. I want to pray that God will be with their children, their grandchildren, amen, to help them, amen, their time of mourning, that God will just be with them, amen. Um, I want to pray for the churches through Mexico, amen. Uh, we were down in at the rally yesterday, uh, this weekend down in Tijuana, and, and uh, it was a good time, amen. A lot of a lot of churches from all over the, all over the country in Mexico that were there. And uh, I just want to pray that God will just be with them, continue to help them, Amen. Uh, they're going to have, <clears throat> excuse me, a marriage seminar down in uh, in Tijuana in a few months. So I want to begin to pray for that, uh, that God opened doors for them and, and uh, God opened doors for us so we can go and, and be a part of what God's doing down there. Amen. Uh, let's pray. Keep praying for the church in Italy. Amen. We've got a couple of churches in Italy for the church in France. Amen. And for doors to open for, for the churches, the church going into Spain. And that God will have his hand upon them. Um, and let's not forget, amen, about the churches in South America, Colombia, Peru, amen. We have a, we have a, an investment in those churches. So let's keep them in prayer, amen. Pastor Robert, amen. Um, Pastor Machacao, amen. And that God will just be with them and, uh, and, and build their church, amen. You know what? Uh, since uh, I'll tell you as a pastor, amen, um, a lot of times finances, they really... They really take a toll on pastors, amen. Because if, if it doesn't come in, we have to we, we pick up the slack. And and uh, when you're in a, a country like like Peru or Colombia, they don't have resources the way we do, amen. You know, we hear um, when we're when we're struggling, amen. As a church, um, I just want to start driving for Uber. You know, we have all kinds of different options out here, amen. In those countries, they don't really have a lot of options like that. So we want to pray for them and. And our investment has, has really helped them push, amen, the gospel forward in those countries. So your investments are not in vain. So I want to pray that God will continue to help them and God, that God will continue to build the church, the churches down there. And, and uh, it's, it's, it's the investment so strong and, and, and the move of God is so strong, amen, that we're supposed to have a, our first South American conference this year, amen, in Colombia. Amen. And that's a direct result of what, what God's doing, amen, through our ministry. So you know what? want to keep them in prayer and God will just to God will just continue to bless it and expand into the countries in South America amen and uh, and God will just continue to help amen so you know what we could trust in God this evening this morning amen uh, no matter what you're going through no matter what your situation is you know what you got to understand that God's in control That's right. sometimes we don't think God's in control because it's, the situation is too big for us to handle but 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 God says he's in control so trust in God this, this morning amen yes. believe in God let God help you Amen. As we cry out for God, amen. So let's worship God, amen, as we open up in prayer, man. Let's worship God. Hallelujah, my Lord. I praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, my Father, we thank you, God, this morning, God, for their opportunity I presented us God allowing us God to bring our petitions before your precious throne of grace God we pray God for each and every need God each and every soul in this place God we pray God uh, for the churches God uh, throughout the world God and we pray God uh, for every life in here God every marriage every every person God every sickness every hurt every pain every bit of anger God we we lay it before you God and we pray right now God in the name of Jesus God that you just touch lives touch hearts God minister God God that you'll be glorified God we thank you my Lord we praise you my Lord and in Jesus name we pray amen amen uh, uh, amen you take time to greet someone this morning amen <laughs> Oh, that's your one 
Hey man, we got some announcements this morning. Uh, I want to remind you of our regular services every Sunday morning at 10 a.m., every Wednesday at 7. Don't forget to uh, follow us on Facebook, like us on Facebook, amen. I use our YouTube channel, amen, as a as an outreach tool, amen. Send uh, send send our sermons, videos to, to those you know that, that can use, amen, a little bit of Word of God in their lives, amen. Don't forget, next Saturday, this coming Saturday, we're having a men's class. We've rented the Jerupa Community Center off of Pedley. And uh, I'm asking, uh, uh, amen, if we can be here at 9 o'clock, amen, because we've got to load up the equipment. Uh, we're taking speakers and, and the, the sound uh, cabinet. And uh, I gotta, I'm got i going to be a probably come on uh, Thursday and uh, pack it all, get it ready. Um, so we gotta, i got to get all that ready. And then uh, Saturday, we got to take it to the, to the community center. I want to meet here at 9, so we can be there uh, promptly at 10. Cause they open the doors at 10 and we have to set up uh we're gonna need all the help we can get amen so it's the men's class but we need men and women to help us because we got to set up chairs and i got to set up, i can't set up the sound and chairs at the same time amen so i'm gonna need help with that so i got to set up the sound and i'm gonna need help people setting up chairs and getting some tables ready for the food um so that'll be this saturday and don't forget uh that's gonna be we're gonna have pastor alfonso lara from uh Dias de mayo in tijuana and he will remain with us next Sunday. Amen. So next Sunday, we will have Pastor Alfonso here. Amen. And uh, he's going to preach in Spanish. We'll, have, we'll translate it to English. And he is, he's, he's, he, you see how I'm always all over the place? I mean, people will see me, people will see me and say, man, you're everywhere. Amen. He's the same as I am. He just does it out of Tijuana. Amen. He goes all over the place. He's been to Colombia. He's been, he's been traveling. He's helping churches. He's doing all he can. Um, he's a really good uh, uh, pastor, good man of God. He has comes with a strong, powerful, seasoned word. So I want to encourage you to, to 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 invite someone next Sunday, Amen. If you know somebody who needs God in their life, if you know somebody who needs, that needs needs a a, a, a a change, Amen. This is a good opportunity, Amen. Whenever we have these events, it's a good opportunity to to invite someone, pump it up, say, Hey, you know, we're gonna have this guy. He's coming in, and he's he's man, he's good. He's from somewhere else, and. And get people to come, and you'll be surprised how, how that can change someone's life. Amen. So don't forget, next Sunday, he'll be here with us next Sunday morning. And then this Saturday, if we can, we need help at 9 o'clock here at the church. And then we're going to go down to the to the community center. At, uh, we have to be there by 10. Amen. And the cert, the men's class starts at 11. Amen. <clears throat> uh, March the 11th, we're going to El Centro. It's a Saturday morning. It starts at 1030. Uh, we'll leave here in the morning about 7 o'clock, get down to El Centro. And um, and do the men's class. So they have a men's rally. Uh, Pastor Alex Alcido and Rick Merritt, and then uh, they're gonna feed us after, and then we'll just head right back. Amen. El Centro's really not that far. We've gone down there for the day before. Say, man. So let's let's uh, let's all the men get together and, and see what God has for our lives. On March the 18th, Amen is a woman's fellowship. Amen. Uh, Sister Stephanie and Sister Estrella from. Uh, um, Glendale, Arizona will be will be speaking. Uh, they're going to have food and everything. And on that day, man, uh, just like the women are helping us on Saturday for the men's thing, I'd like to ask if, we, if some of the men we can get together and go help Pastor Robert as they set up some of this stuff for the women. Amen. Uh, I went last time and helped them. And uh, there's a lot of preparation that goes on outside as the women are being fed. Amen. It's a good opportunity. If, if you're getting tired of your wife nagging at you, amen, she needs Jesus, amen, send her to this thing and go over there and help, amen. And, and, and if not, don't complain about your wife anymore, amen. You're getting the opportunity for God to go minister to her, amen. So let's go over there and, and be a part of it. And that goes for you women, too. If your husband's are nagging at you and at pain, amen, well, go and be a part of it and help, amen, so we can go get ministered to her, amen. Uh, on March the 19th, Sunday, March the 19th, 10 o'clock, we are going to have evangelist uh, Vince Margolis, amen. He will be here on Sunday the, the 19th. Amen. I've been speaking with them. He's excited. Um, he always comes with a good word. Uh, he's he's uh, old school. He's from the streets. And you can tell when he's preaching, he comes from the streets. He reminds me of uh, uh, Bob McCardle's ministry, which Bob is Chaplain Bob, and uh, which is 
the one who discipled him. Amen. And a uh, great, great, great man of God, good, good friend. And uh, uh, invite someone. So March 19th, amen, invite someone. That's the next That's the next month. We're going to have some. Almost every month, amen, up until about July, we have somebody. We're going to have somebody come and minister, amen. And, and, and God's going to, you're going to see God move and use these opportunities, amen, for allow God to, 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 so you can invite someone, amen. Amen. So you know what? These are the announcements, amen. We're going to lift up an offering. So let's worship God. Amen. You know, we lift up offerings all the time, and, and I was trying to figure out, you know, something to say for the offering. And I've heard all kinds of different ways to say it. Amen. Um, I've heard, I've heard uh, people say, I've heard preachers say, you know, the basket's in the back, give if you want. I've heard preachers say, uh, you're a thief because you don't give, you know. And, and so you always try to figure, you know, something to say, because you want, you want people to be moved. And you understand when we lift up offerings, it's not because we want your money. We really, it's, it's really not about that. And, and I always say this, if that's what you think, if you think all I want is your money, then just keep your wallet in your pocket and it's okay. You don't need to give. But the reason why we do this, because this gives an opportunity, opportunity to you to, to offer God your sacrifice, your, your, your offering. Amen. Remember the offering is what? Jesus Christ was on the cross. Your offering is what is what Abraham did uh, when he went to sacrifice his son, and God provided the offering for him. That's the offering. It's it's what we give to God, and we say, God, here I'm fully surrendering, and this is on you. And and, and that's what that is. If you ever want to, if you ever want to, if you ever want to raise at work, you know that you can't ask God for a raise if you don't if you don't pay your tithes. You you, you can't. It, it, God, God's not gonna listen because He ain't gonna have, He ain't gonna give you more money for when you're not faithful what He's already given you. You can't say, God, give me a better job if you don't pay your tithes, because why would God give you a better job so you can continue to to rob Him? And it's biblical; it's what the Bible says. So the purpose of of, of doing an offering is because what we're doing is when we give an offering, is we're preparing the altar. For the word of God. See, we worship God. We sing songs. That's, we sing songs for a reason. Singing songs brings the presence of God. We're ushering in the presence of God. That's why we sing praises under God. So when you're singing and we're singing songs, it's extremely important because we're ushering in the presence of God. We do, we do, we do an offer. We, we open in prayer, right? And then we do an offering. The reason why we do an offering is because Right before the word of God, we're surrendering to God. That's what the offering is for. It's an opportunity for us to surrender. It's our last opportunity before the word of God is preached to say, God, I am surrendering to you because whatever you have for me, I'm going to be open to it. And I'm going to listen to you. And we're surrendering to God. Remember, we're not paying God. We're surrendering to God. Because most people, the, the last sign of surrenderance is in their giving. And we surrender to God because we are now preparing the altar so that the word of God can be preached. We've already established his presence. Now we've laid down the offering and we're saying, God, I'm ready to receive from you. Yes. And when we receive from God, we now have the opportunity to come to the altar and, 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 and pray. And the reason why it's important that we do that at the very end is because by that time, We've already ushered the presence. We've brought in a full surrender so we can receive. And the altar and the platform of God has been prepared so that we can come to the altar and be touched by God. Yes. That's the importance of what we do here. So what, what you do when you give is important to the move of God and how God's going to move in lives. We think of the offering as just as a time when we're, we're, where the preacher is asking for your wallet. And that's not what it's about. It's really not. We, we we had the other building, and we got this building. The rents between the two are pretty similar. And it's done that way because my wife and I, we decided that when we opened that, hey, we're coming in with nobody, so let's let's make it so where, you know, if we have to sacrifice, we sacrifice. And thank God I haven't had to sacrifice in this church by myself this whole time. But, but the point is, is that we did it so that when you give, you're giving because... You're surrendering. You're, you're, you're releasing. And you're saying, God, here, I'm giving to you because...
this is what I want to do. It gives you the full liberty to do it free willing, free willingly, and not because Pastor Ben. I, I've been in a church where the pastor he said, "Well, we need this much money because we need this. We need this much money because we need that. <laughs> you know, I, we need money because we need food. We need food. We need food." Never cooked a day in their life, and they went to eat every single day. Yeah. Went out to eat every day, and that's not the way it works. That's not the way. That's not the way. I, I decide we're Thank not going to do it that way. We're not going to do it that way. I want people to give because it's what you want to. Do. That's right. I don't want. I don't want to starve because I'm waiting on somebody to give at church, and then it makes me bitter. That's not the way I work. So what I do is we make it to where eh, we have to sacrifice. We sacrifice, but you know what? It gives you the liberty to say, God, okay, I have surrendered. So you know what? We, we have online giving with Zell. You can give on with Zell, uh, ND, ndgive at gmail.com. Bring your tithes, give your offering, and support missions. Uh, we will be sending the missions money uh, at the beginning of next <laughs> week. Uh, we send it every month, amen, to Peru and Colombia. And uh, be a part of what God's doing. We are reaching the world for Jesus, yeah. and you are a part of that, amen. So you know what? Let's bow our hearts, amen, as we bless both the gift and the giver. God, my Father, we thank you, God, for this time, for this opportunity you have presented us, God, to give into your kingdom. God, I pray, God, that with this offering, God, that you would speak to our hearts, God. God, in the Bible, in the Bible it says, is in the same measure in which we give, God, we will receive, God. And we give, God, wholeheartedly, God, unto your kingdom right now, God, a full releasing, God, of who we are, God, a full, a full releasing that you may pour out into our lives, God. Speak to us right now, God, and touch us, God. But speak to us in the measure in which we have measured and given unto you, God, allowing, God, us to help fulfill your gospel and move your word forward. We thank you, God, for all that you're doing. We praise you. We worship you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. The angels bow before him and at the door. What a mighty God we serve. And what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. The angels bow before him and at the door. What a mighty God we serve. So this morning, <coughs> I'm going to bring a simple message, and what I'm doing is I'm I'm setting up with, for what we're going to be doing in Bible study for the next next few weeks. So in Bible study, starting Wednesday, we're gonna we're gonna go into a series of, uh, uh, regarding discipleship and the importance of discipleship. We always hear the word disciple, thinking of just the men, amen. But women can disciple women and become women of God. So we're going to talk about what discipleship is. Not just, well, I'm a disciple. Because when I opened up this church, I said, my name is Pastor Ben Marino. And I, I have been appointed the pastor of this church. But the title pastor is a title earned. And I will earn that title. The same thing happens with disciple. You cannot be a disciple if you, if you don't earn the title disciple. Right. There's work that goes into it. You can't just say, I'm a disciple because I go to church. No, you're a church attender. So there's a word to it. And, and when we get into it, some for some people to open their eyes and be like, okay, that's what I need to do. Other people will be mad and say, well, I don't like it. But either way, we're going to go into it so we can understand the biblical concept of it. So today what I'm doing is I'm going to preach a, I'm going to preach a simple gospel because I think it's important that sometimes we got to get, we got to be in ba back to basics. And lately, this is where we're at. We're, we're, we're going back to basics because we need to remember the love of God. Amen. You know, and we got to remember who God is to us. You know, as as a parent, we, we, we try to give our kids everything, right? We, we try to give them everything we could possibly give. That includes finances. That includes education, comfort, love. Most parents try to give, give their kids things and opportunities that they never had. My kids, I taught them from, from before they went to school, before they entered kindergarten or, or Head Start preschool, I was teaching them already that, that college was part of the process. I never taught them that they can go to high school and then if they want to go to college, they can. 
I never taught them that. I taught them that high school was the automatic, just like from elementary to middle school to high school. College was the automatic. I never gave them the option. I never, I never told them they couldn't. I never told them they had to. But what I, what I did is I embedded into them, hey, this is, what, this is, the, way life, this is the way life takes you, and, and, and let them go. Because that was never done to me. In my house, in my house, it was it wasn't even it was to considered to even graduate high school. It wasn't even a thought. It was it was like who graduates high school? Who in the heck is that? And then just that's what it was. And we and we do all of our best to provide for our children. And and, and, and we, we we work we work for our kids and and we and we saw we even saw our parents work and provide for us. But it seems sometimes as our children get older that they have a tendency to, to forget about how much we've shown them and how much we loved them. As kids get older, they get smarter in their own mind. Amen. Not in reality. They just get smarter in their own mind. What, what that means is, is, is you're going to find, amen, as your children become teenagers and young adults, amen, that they're smarter than you. They, they know more than you. And, 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 and we should change all the kids' names to Google, amen, because they know more than anything. They know, more, they know it all, <laughs> amen. And, 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 and that's, but that's the reality. They begin to know more than you. They know more than you so much that, that they begin to come against you because now you don't know anything. I'm smarter than you. You don't even know. You don't have the life experience I have. Is, are you kidding me? I know of teenagers, amen, who aren't even of age, amen, meaning they're not even 18, who, who, who try to give marital advice. He don't even have a girlfriend. Are you kidding me? Yeah, but they're so wise at my young age. No, you're not. You're stupid. Sit down. But this is what happens. And, and, and our children, they'll, sometimes they'll put us through, 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 through things. See, even though our love for our children never changes, it only gets stronger. Amen. No matter no matter what, even when your kids when your kids rebel and your kids come against you, but we get mad at them, right? We want to smack them, but we love them, right? We want to smack them because we love them. But then we want to quote scripture why we smacked them. Bible says, beat them with a rod and you'll deliver their soul from hell. And you know, we want to quote that scripture all day, right? But it doesn't change our love. If anything, as we get older and as they get older, amen, we mature. Because we mature, amen. Because when you have your first kid, you don't know nothing. You know absolutely nothing. Then when you have your second kid, you just only know a little bit more than you knew last time. We don't know nothing. We begin to understand about the fullness of, of raising children when we start having grandchildren. Because now... We want to sit there and tell our, our, our children how they're doing it wrong. So we don't, we don't really know. We're just trying to work our way through it. But we've given it all to our children. And even though they come against us, amen, we love them. We love our kids to death. I say this. I love my kids to, the de to death, right? I love them to death so much, amen. I'm, sometimes I want to kill them, amen. I love them to death. And that's how we are. We love our children no matter what. It's unconditional. We love our children. And if you know what, if you don't know what that is, when do you have grandchildren? It changes. It cha it's a game changer. Yeah. See, and as as they get older, the, the the goal is is that they'll come back and begin to understand that the mom and dad are not the enemy. That they, you know, what the things that they that we that they put us through, the things that they told us was for was for their own good, and that's the hope that we pray that they come back and and that they understand that you know what that we're not the enemy. You know, and this, and this is and this is the reality of what it is to raise children. You know, and 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 we all have children, amen. And and, and I got three, and out of the three, there's only one I know I'm going to live with when I get old. You know, I, I I've already decided. Me and my wife already said, no, we're living with him. I already know. He's going to take care of us. The other one's going to leave us in the back room. The other one's going to chain us. So I, I I'm going to stay with him, right? That's just what we think. But this is the reality of of raising children. And then we know that, amen, that, that no matter what, we love our children. We love them wholeheartedly. Yeah. We love them to the point that we will give them absolutely everything. Because as you get older, you're waiting for your children to mature. But as they're getting older maturing, we're maturing. 
and we become ha we begin to have more understanding of what life has done with them, and we begin to balance it out. Things we used to get mad at, we don't really get mad at anymore. We begin to balance because we begin to understand because just as they're getting older and mature, we get older and mature. As we live for God, we know that Jesus loves us. We know that. You guys know God loves you, right? God loves you. You know that God loves you so much, he loves you more than you love your own children. You know, I, I would lay down my life for my kids. I would. I, I would absolutely get killed for my kids. We're recently, we're recently experiencing this in our, in our family where, where a family member laid down his life for his parents. And, 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 and we, we know this to be true. I'll lay down my life for my kids. Do you know that God loves you? That he laid down his life for you? God absolutely loves you. He laid down the life of his own son. Right? He loves you. That, that See, we, as we live for God, we need to, to know that Jesus loves us. And we, we need to understand that he died and rose from the dead for us. However, as we serve God, sometimes, we sometimes forget the power of the blood and the resurrection. We forget. As Christians, we forget how powerful the blood and the resurrection is of Jesus Christ. Because we go through things. And, 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 and we don't draw from that, from that power, from that blood, from that resurrection of Christ. We don't draw from it. We know it exists. We're not, I'm not saying that you don't know God exists or you don't love God or, or you don't believe Jesus Christ died on the cross or you don't believe he rose again. That's far from it. We know that that's true. We know that we love God. We know that God loved us. But what happens is we live for God. We forget, amen, the power that's in his resurrection and in his blood. See, there's power there. See, and that's the same thing that happens with our children. We hope that, you know what, even though they push us aside, amen, that one day they're going to remember the power of their parents, how they gave them life and provided everything for them. Everything. I don't make a ton of money. I'm not rich. But I fought for years to make the amount of money I make today so I can provide my kids so much. I didn't realize how hard I worked to make the amount of money I have, to make it to make is until my kids became adults and started paying for themselves. Then I began to say, "What? Well, when did my check get that size? I don't remember that. It's always been that size. How do you get bigger? I don't understand that. Not that I make more money. It's not that I'm rich. What it is is that I'm not paying for them no more. Right? They're paying for themselves. Yep, that's and I hope our hope is for our children is that they'll remember." the sacrifice that we made for them. That as they have children, they will, they will think, have you ever thought about your own parents? I remember thinking about my parents and thinking, how in the heck did they feed all of us? We were so ungrateful. We didn't appreciate nothing. We complained if the milk gallon was empty. We got mad if we had beans and rice again. How dare her, right? And that, we, we didn't appreciate it. We didn't appreciate it. And then one day, I, I get married, and I begin to have children. And my little, my little babies become big monsters. And they're eating everything in the house and bringing all their friends to eat the rest of it. And I begin to wonder, man, I only have three kids. My mom had five. How in the heck? Not only she had five, she raised my nephew too. And then she had people living with us always, <laughs> feeding families down the neighborhood. And I, and I think, how does she do that? And you know what I'm talking about? How did my mom and dad do that? And then we think, okay, as our children get older, we hope that one day they realize all the stuff that they've come against us with, that they realize, man, my parents really sacrificed for me. Then my parents ever sac really sacrificed for me. I never realized that, that, that my mom would buy me shoes when my dad's shoes had holes in it. I never realized that until I did it. Until I 
until I needed shoes. The soles of my shoes were, 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 were talking, amen, flipping and flopping all over the place. But my kids had new shoes on because I knew they had to go to school. And I don't realize that until I started to get older. I said, man, how did my mom do it? How did my dad do it? And what happens is as we live for God, we forget about that power of the resurrection, the power of the blood of God, and, and, and how we're going through problems. And, and sometimes we push away. Well, oh, God, you just don't understand what I'm going through. God, you just don't understand the problems that I have. Yeah, I know you're mighty and powerful. God, I believe in the power of the cross. I believe in your resurrection. I believe in the blood. And I know that you rose again. I get that, God. But man, I'm going through something you just don't understand. Now, we don't say those words. But the problem is we also don't bring them to God. We go through our problems by ourselves. And we stray away from our, from our Father and say, you know what, God, I got this. I'm smarter than you right now. Now, we don't say those words. Our children don't say those words, but they give us that attitude. See, and when it comes to God, we go through some situations, some problems in our life. And instead of surrendering more unto God so he can begin to help us, we pull back from God and say it doesn't work. Well, see, if I know if I prayed more, I'd get better results. But I've already prayed and got no results. And I prayed one whole day for one, one whole hour. And I didn't get no results. And we began to push God away because we didn't get the results that we wanted when we wanted them. And it's not that we don't believe in God or we don't love God. Because our, our, our children, make no mistake, your, your children love you. No matter how they treat us, no matter how they come against us, no matter how smarter they, they are than us, no matter how much more they know, because they got all this infinite wisdom, right? They still love you. They still love you. They absolutely love you. They just want to listen to you right now. They don't want to hear what you have to say because you're not that smart. They know more than you. And this is the same attitude we give to God. God, I love you. I know you know what I, I haven't forsaken you, God. I'm not going back into the streets, God. I'm not going to go back to the life I used to have. I'm going to keep coming to church, God, and I'm going to sit down in my chair, and you know what? I'll, pay, I'll even pay my tithes. But I'm going to go through this because I'm going to go through this. I can do this on my own. And that's what we do. We go through it on our own. Instead of turning to God and saying, God, I can't do this no more. I'm going to surrender to you. Can you imagine? Have you ever thought about the things that your children go through? And, and, and just think to yourself, if they would just let me help them, they wouldn't have to go through this. But they won't let you help them. I've seen my kids make a bunch of mistakes, and I'm looking, I'm like, man, if they would have just, they would just let me help them, they won't have to go through this. But they won't let me help them. This, this, is, this is reality. We see this in our children. And God's sitting there looking at us saying, if you would just let me help you. If you would let me, let me, let me, let me be a part of your, your problem and your situation, I can give you the guidance that you need. See, although we do not intentionally do this, but the, do, we, don't, we don't do this intentionally, but this is a common practice for the followers of Christ. We become more familiar and become complacent in the things of God. There's a level of complacency. And I know what some of you are thinking right now. What's complacency mean? I'm going to tell you. <laughs> to be complacent is defined as this. Smug. Self-satisfied. Meaning, I got this. I can do this. Pleased with oneself. Proud of oneself. Self-approving. Self-congratulatory. Self-admiring, self-regarding, or even gloating, triumphant, proud, pleased, gratified, content. It also means careless, slack, lax, and lazy. And as Christians, we can become complacent. I got this. I don't need to worry about that. Do you know that if you would just take time to pray, we're having prayer this Friday. 
right? We're having prayer this Friday. If you take time to come to prayer, you know God can help you with your problem. That's right. And you know when I say this, for every every time we're gonna have a prayer meeting, come to prayer, come to prayer. God can help you with your problem. That's right. And there's always there's always just three or four of us in prayer. And yet the problem still exists. It's like a parent looking at their children saying, but I, I, I can help you with that. And I tell my son that, you know, he moved out and I said, you know, you know, if you need anything, just tell me. If you need food, you need gas, you need help with your rent, you need help with utility, whatever it is you need, you tell me. I'll be there. You just let me know. I'll send you money, I'll go do it for you, whatever it is you need. But he's a lot like me. Doesn't want to ask. And then finally, I had to talk to him again. So then he asked. And I said, okay. And I sent him some money. Went to his house and fixed some, fixed some furniture stuff he had. Showed him how to do it so next time he can, he can do it and get him out of the house. And once he understood that I'm still here for him, even though he moved out, he calls me all the time now. <laughs> asking and asking and asking oh gosh she's asking <laughs> but it's good because he knows where to turn because he, knew, he knows dad didn't abandon him he knows that as he's being coming his own man and, and the man of his own house he understands that it's okay that dad's still here to help you know that as you as you build yourself as a Christian, as a follower and believer of Jesus Christ, you know that it's okay still to lean on God. Right. It's okay to say, God, you know what? I, I just can't quite make it through this. You know it's okay. You know, so when we have prayer on Friday, it's okay. You say, God, I, I, I need help with this. Amen. And, and, and as a pastor, you see when, when the prayer room, when the prayer meeting's empty. I look at it and I think, man, man, what, what am I doing wrong? How come the church is perfect and I'm not? Because they must be perfect because they don't need to come to prayer. <laughs> Their lives must be amazing. They must have it all together. My life is so jacked up, I need to be here on Friday to pray. And I come because I got to lay it down, God. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. You know... I have, like I said, I have a son who moved out. And he doesn't go to church. He's not saved. He's living with his fiance. And, you know, I, I come and pray. You know why? Because that's new to me. I've never, I've never lived that before. I've never had a son who had his own place, who lived in fornication, who, who drove a lot of miles in traffic every day whose life is on the line, he may die and go to hell because he's not saved. I've never been in that situation before. So I gotta come and pray. Mm -hmm. Oh, but he's doing good, he's working, they got their house, their furniture and all. Yeah, I get all that. But where's his soul? Right. My life's not together, so I come and pray. So I think, man, the church must be amazing. Maybe I can get, I can take some notes from them because their life is perfect. They don't have to pray. They don't have to be here Friday. We're having prayer Friday, seven o'clock, right here in this building. Mm -hmm. We don't change it, we don't move it. It's gonna be every other week, we do it right here. We've been doing it already for a couple months. Yeah. This last this last Friday, last time we had it, actually we had a pretty good crowd yeah. showed up. Yeah. It was really good. Right. But we can't forget that God is still there. There's still power in the cross. There's still power in his resurrection. There's still power in the blood. In John 14, 6, Jesus says in John 14, 6, real simple, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus says it real simply. If you're looking and you're confused and you're trying to figure out how come you're not getting through this and how come it's so hard, Jesus said, made it real simple. He goes, I could tell you why right now. Because what you're doing is wrong. 
And he's saying, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. The reason why you feel like everything's falling apart and this is death, and that this isn't working, is because you're not turning to me, Jesus says. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You've been trying to figure this out on your own. You're acting like your, your, your young child who, who's rebelled against you, who changed their name to Google because they know more than you. And that's what it is. And for the girls, their name is Alexa. Because they know more. <laughs> they got both. Right? And that's what it is. And Jesus, Jesus still keeps it simple. He keeps it real. He keeps it right to the point. He goes, wait, 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 hold on, hold on. Google, Alexa, kick back. There ain't no Wi-Fi right now. You don't know what you're talking about. He says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. And in case you forgot, no one can come to my Father unless they come through me. So don't think that God's just going to snap his finger and get it done if we haven't taken time to bring it to him. He's the way, he's the truth, he's the life. And we want to quote the scripture really easy when we tell everyone else when we say John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should, have, should not perish, but have everlasting life. And we quote the scripture. Like we're living the scripture. It's a part of who we are. When we're turning away from our father the way our children turn away from us. So as we come to church, we declare with conviction that we love Jesus. And I'm not saying we don't. And we, we say we love Jesus. We say we, we're, we're Christians. I'm not saying that we're sinners or backsliders. However, I am saying as we live our lives, we sometimes stray away from the simple words that brought us to salvation to begin with. The simple things that brought us to salvation. We forget. Remember, Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through me. What a powerful statement. Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through me, which means he is the only way to heaven. He is the absolutely only way to heaven. If you want peace in your life, if you want a glimpse of heaven in your life, there's only one way. Right. That's through Jesus Christ. Right. If, you want, if you want some sanity back in your family, if you want to see salvation in your children, there's only one way. That's Jesus Christ. No one comes to the Father except through me, he says. If you, if you want peace in your life again, if you want, you want God to move in your life again, you want God to use your life again, Jesus makes it simple. No one comes to the Father except through me. And he's basically saying, dude, get it right. Stop looking everywhere else. You're looking everywhere else. When the answer was right here. I remember my, my son, as he moved out, he was stressed, man. He was going through it. He was just going through it because, because he always seen his dad. He never knew the things I went through. He just saw that I took care of it. Dad went to work. Dad paid the bills. Mom did this. Mom did that. And they just did it, right? And that's all he saw. So in his mind is, well, I just got to do it. He begins to stress out. And I had to actually sit him down and say, Leo, look at it. No, 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 Leo. It's okay. That's what we're here for. This is what family does. We're going to be here for you. I will do this for you. And I had to bring him back to the understanding that it's okay to ask for help at any age. You know it's okay to ask for help at any age? It doesn't matter. My brother lost his wife a, a few weeks ago. He's my oldest brother. He calls me. I'm the second to the youngest, and he calls me. He says, man, I'm just not feeling it. He reaches out. It doesn't matter how old you are. We can still reach out to God and say, God, I, I, I don't have this. It doesn't matter how long you've been saved. We take pride in, well, I've been saved for a trip. I've been saved since, since Moses parted the Red Sea. I don't care. We still need God. The gospel hasn't changed. There's still no way to the Father except through Jesus Christ. I'm not saying we're backslid. I'm not saying you're not saved. What I'm saying is we got to remember where our salvation comes from, where our refuge is. We spend so much time knowing more than God. 
that we've eliminated God from taking care of our families, from taking care of our salvation. Too many Christians are looking for answers outside of the church and outside of God. You think about this and ask yourself if this is true in your own life. You know that there's Christians today. I'm a Christian. I believe in Christ. You know, no, I'm not a I'm not a Christian that believes in saints. I'm a Christian that believes in Christ. I'm a Christian. I believe in the blood of Jesus Christ. I have been saved, I've been sacrificed, washed, cleansed. My name has been written in the book of life. That's us. You know that there's Christians, and ask yourself. If this is true in your own life, when you go through something, they will take their problem, their situation, their concern, whatever it is, and share it with a non-believer, with someone else who's not saved, someone else who does not go to church, someone else who has not given their life to God, and they take their problem to them. This is far too often the reality of today's church when we take our problem and speak to someone else you see my brother had we have I have two other brothers a nephew a sister all over there by where my brother lives he lives in Pennsylvania I live in California but when he goes to something he calls me because he's saved he's he's been he's been set free he's washed he's cleansed sanctified and he knows if he wants God to advise, he's going to have to ask God to now. He knows. But too many Christians are taking their problems and talking to non-believers. Yeah, but it's my dad or it's my mom, it's my cousin, and you don't know how close we are. I get all that. But what you're not getting is we no longer live in a physical world. This is a spiritual, this is a spiritual battle. This is the Bible says we battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, right? Up against darkness, evil things, things that are coming against us spiritually. You ever wonder how can you, you ever wake up and you just don't feel it? It's like, I just, I just ain't feeling it. It's because it's a spiritual battle. It's not physical. I'd rather, I'd rather be physically sick than to be spiritually hurt. Because when I'm spiritually wounded, man, it, it's hard to break out of that. It is really hard to break out of that. But if I was physically sick, well, I'll just take some medicine, take some, get some rest, and I'll be all right tomorrow. But man, but when I'm when I'm spiritually wounded, and that's tough. That's tough. And too many Christians are taking taking their problems and, and, and bringing it to the non-believer, and 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 no longer placing their faith in God. It's like I said, we want to provide for our children. We want to give them a better life. We worked our fingers to the bone to do this. We went hungry to do this. We bought them shoes when ours had holes on our when we had holes in our socks. So as a parent, we always want to give our children the absolute best. See, everyone who knows me knows about my kids. Because I'm proud of my children. I really am. They're not perfect by any means. They do some dumb things, some really dumb things. And, but I'm so proud of them. You know, I still talk about them. I brag about them. I've been driving for Uber. You know, my passengers, they know about my kids. I talk to them about my, I talk to them about my wife, and I talk to them about my kids, I talk to them about my church. That's what I talk to them about. They have no idea what they're getting, what they're getting when they get into my car, what they're in for. <laughs> so they get into my car I, I get them to open up and tell them about me and then I hit them with the gospel I get people crying before I drop them off they have no idea and, 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 and I love my kids to death everybody knows about my kids why? because I talk about them I brag about them because I love them so much and I want you to think about that God the Father the Bible says that we have been we have been adopted into the royal family that we cry out all the father right we're adopted we're related through the blood of jesus christ right we, we're, we're heirs to the throne and it says that we're joint heirs with christ right so that means that we we are we are we are in that bloodline 
Can you imagine with that being said? That God the Father's in heaven telling the angels, look at me, look at me, look what she's doing. Ah, oh, she's so good, she's so good. I, yeah, I know she keeps messing up, but man, she's got it together, man. Look at, she's gonna make it. I, I wanna help her. You know, I can't help her right now. She has to come and ask me because, you know, if you meddle with her, she's gonna get mad at me and think she knows more than me, so I gotta step back. <laughs> But I want to help her. But man, look at look how good she's doing. Remember how she used to be? Look how good she's doing now. And that's what God's doing. He's bragging, just like I brag about mine. And God's up in heaven bragging to the angels about who you are, and what you've come from, and how far you've succeeded, and how much you've turned away from sin, and how much you've moved forward. And he's saying, God, I want to help you so much more. Just you just gotta come and ask. You know, my son never asked, I never would help him. I would let him, I would let him lose his car and I would let him lose his apartment. I will. Because part of being a man is learning how to open your mouth. That's just part of being a man. If I step in and do it for him without asking, I'm not giving him a chance to be a man to figure this out. I'm not giving him a chance to learn how to open his mouth because if I don't teach him that, he's never going to teach my grandchildren that. So I got to, he, he's going to have to learn. But when he needs help, I'm right there. But until he asks, I, I'm not going to do it. If he gets evicted because he didn't pay his rent, he's going to say, well, Dad, I, you know, what happened to him? Well, Dad, I just, you know, I just you know, didn't have enough money. How come we didn't have enough money? Well, you know, what? Uh, we had this, we had that. What are we asking? Well, I don't, I don't know. What do you, you don't know? How many times do I have to tell you? If you ask me, I'm going to help you. How many times are, do I need to go and put it in your pocket? No. Part of being a man is stepping up and doing something about it. Part of being a Christian, a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ is stepping up and saying, God, I need help from you. How can I be a man of God or a woman of God if I can't open my mouth and say, Father, I need your help right now. How? God, save my children. I can't stink and deal with these guys no more. They're, they're stinking devils. They're demons. I can't do nothing. I heard a sermon years ago by Greg Johnson, uh, and, and, and it, he talked about kids, and he called them demon seeds. <laughs> they are. Stinking kids are demon seeds. But we love them. Yeah. We love them to death, but they're stinking little devils running around sometimes. What do you think we are to God? What makes us any better? Running away from the very grace he has given us. But dad, I lost my place. I've got evicted. I don't know where to stay. Oh, and by the way, they repoed my car too. What do you mean they repoed your car? Well, yeah, I didn't have enough, you know. Well, if I need an ass, I would've helped you. Well, dad, you know, I just figured I had to do it myself. Why would you have to do it by yourself? Have I ever left you on the side of the road by yourself? Haven't I always been there for you? Haven't I always helped you? I'm not gonna do it for you. I'm not going to go to your job and work for you. Just like I'm not going to pick up your bills and pay it for you. But when you need help, you ask me, and I'll be there. Meanwhile, we do the same thing with God. The famous thing of, well, God knows. God knows. How many times do you see your kid get ready to do something, and you let them do it because they have to learn? Oh, but God knows. Well, you knew. You knew. You still let your kids stick that screwdriver in the light socket? <laughs> Don't do that. Whether you like it or not, you are a child. Of, you are a child. Your child, whether you like it or not, your child is a reflection of who you are and a, resu a result of how you raise them. Listen to me. Although they do tend to get a screw loose every once in a while, right? Mm -hmm. Remember, you were not always saved either. No, Before you gave your life to God, you had a lot of screws loose too. Right? This is who we are. Our children are a reflection of who we are. And Jesus says this in John 14, 7. He says, if you know me, he says, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. This is what Jesus says. He said, if you would have known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. 
Okay? So if we know God, we're, if, 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 if we know God, people, they're going to see God through our lives. Our children, when they look at our children, you can tell that that... I've, I've, seen, I've talked to, to grown men, typically late 20s, early 30s, and I can tell them, you are raised by your mom. You are raised by your mom. I can tell you you are raised by your mom. You can, you, can see, you can see young girls. You spend a lot of time with your dad. You spend a lot of time with your dad. You just know. You just know. Because you can see the reflection of them. You know who it is. You guys know what I'm talking about. You know who it is. But we're children of God. And Jesus says, if you know me, then you know my father. So when people see us, do they know our father? Do they know who we're a reflection of? Are we a reflection of God? How many times have you seen a kid walking next to their, uh, a boy not walking next to their dad and they walk the same? They got that same wobble, <laughs> right? Isn't it insane? It's insane. <laughs> We're a direct reflection of who Jesus Christ is. We're a direct reflection. The wonderful thing about this is that is if we're a reflection of him, that means we're a reflection of hope. And if we're a reflection of him, we're a reflection of blessing. It also means we're a reflection of healing. It also means we're a reflection of, of forgiveness. It also means we're, we're a reflection of kindness. We're a reflection of blessing. Understand this. In John 14, 12, and 14, 12 to 14, it says, Jesus is talking, he says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And how powerful is that? Jesus says, if you believe in me, the things that I did, you're going to do them too. Don't think you get away with it. What did Jesus do? Talk, he, talked to the, he talked to those who didn't have salvation. He brought salvation to them. He says, he says, if those, he says, he says, he says, if you believe in me, you're going to do the same works. So those without salvation, he brought it to them. Those who were sick, he healed them. Those who were hungry, he fed them. Right? When he needed answers and he needed something from the Father, he said, disciples, stay out of my way. I got to go pray. There's a prayer meeting Friday. I got to be there. And that's what Jesus did, right? He says, if, if, if you believe in me, you're going to do what I did. He didn't say, if you believe in me, um, I'm going to give you a, a sheet and just check off the boxes that you want. No. He says, if you believe in me, you're going to do what I did. You're going to bring salvation to the lost. You're going to bring healing to, to, to those who are, who are sick. People ask me all the time, how do you do all the things that you're doing? How are you over here? How are you over there? Well, I don't got time for my own life. I got time to do God's work. Life's too short, man. I ain't got time. This is, this is truly my fun. This, and and I'm not, I'm, I don't do this because I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor because I've been doing this. And I think of it this way. My true thought is this. God promised me that my family would get saved. Those around me would get saved. It's a promise of God. It's a declaration. It's a covenant God has made with us in the Bible. It's the word of God is truth. He made a covenant with me. The deal is, if I know Jesus, if I believe in Jesus, I will do the works that he did, which means i got to do the works of God and trust and believe that he's going to take care of all of them. So if I miss a birthday, an anniversary, or whatever, well then, so what? They'll understand when they're standing this in the judgment seat. They're gonna understand that day. They're gonna be like, oh man, this is why dad missed our birthday. This is why dad missed the anniversary. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for allowing my dad to do that. I'm gonna take care of the king of business first. I ain't got time for this other stuff. I ain't got time for it. I, God, I'm going to do this. You bring my wife with me, and we're going to go forward. And let's just do it. 
Right now, a lot of people are getting to know me all through Mexico because I've been going everywhere. I've been doing all kinds of things. Oh, I travel around the world. And one of the big things is, is well, there's Pastor Ben, and there's his wife. They're always together. She goes everywhere he goes. Because to know Jesus means I got to do the work that Jesus did. No, I, I'm, I don't walk on water unless they're, unless they're put in bottles and in a case. I can walk on that. But other than that, I don't, I don't walk on water. Then I'm not perfect. My Bible tells me no one's perfect. No, not one. In John 3.17, it says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I think Christians are spending too much time telling Jesus about their problems and not enough time telling their problems about their Jesus. When was the last time you looked at your problem and said, you know what, my God's bigger than you, stinking devil. My Bible says that we can tell the mountain to move and get out of our way, right? That's what it says. The problem that's so big for us Stop telling God about us. Tell, tell that problem. Oh my God's bigger than you. Get out of here. I've got time for you. Romans 5.5 5 says, Now hope does not disappoint. Romans 5.5 5, for hope, Now hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been, has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who, has, who was given to us. Hope does not disappoint. There's hope in Jesus. And we know it's because his love has just been poured out into us. Jesus says to ask in his name and he will do it. Our children know that, our, that we are their source of their refuge. They know. I have a daughter that when she turned 18, she laughed. I didn't see her for about three years because she knew more than us. She was better than us. She can do this. We didn't understand. And, oh, okay, well, go ahead. Google, do what you want to do. But when she hit a wall, she just walked in our door. Oh, hi, man. How you doing? Want some meat? As if she never left. That's my daughter. I love her to death. But yeah, she chose to make some dumb mistakes and do some things, but that's okay. That's my daughter. I love her to death. Come back in. How much more is God with us? How much more? Jesus says, ask anything in his name and he'll do it. We need to lay it all down in the hope we have in Jesus Christ. Remember that he is the author and the finisher of our faith. And I'd like everybody about everybody close, just for a moment. Everybody about everybody closed. This is a simple sermon. The simplicity of God, of who God is, and what we mean to him. Right now, God the Father is sitting in heaven, grabbing every angel that goes by him. Hey, come here, come here, come here. Look at my son, look at my daughter, look at look at look how good they are. Look how they're doing. I'm so proud of them. Yeah, they stumble, they fall. They got some bumps and they got some bruises, but you know what? They keep calling upon my name and I love them so much. I'll never forget them. And then every time they walk, they, when they're ready to come walk into my house, I'm going to have the door open for them and offer them something to eat because you know what? I love them. And that's what God's doing in heaven. Amen. So many times we, we, we turn away from that. It's not that we don't love God or we don't trust God or we don't think that he's real. It's just that we get so complacent, so familiar with the things of God that we forget that we need to lean upon him. That we forget that we don't need to go through this by ourselves. So if you're here and you'd like to accept Jesus Christ in your heart, amen, to be the Lord of your life, I'm not asking you to join a church or a program or anything. I'm just saying just simplicity, just accept Jesus Christ and say, okay, I'm going to take one baby step, just move in the right direction. If that's you, you're in this place and you'd like to accept Jesus Christ, you just raise your hand. You know, one more time, you're here. You want to rededicate your life. You want to accept Jesus Christ. You want to say, God, okay, I'm going I'm to give it a shot. I'm going to take a baby step because you know what, God? It's one day at a time for me right now. But you know what, God? I'm going to trust in you. If that's you. You'd like to accept Jesus Christ. Amen. You can just raise your hand. 
I'm going to change one of the service. Today, God spoke to you about just reaching out to him, saying, God, you know what? I've turned from you. I didn't leave you because I know you never left me, but I turned from you because I think I had to figure it out. And God, I'm sorry that I've been giving my problems to my friends and to my, my family and, and to people who are not following you, God. But you know what? I want to give it back to you, God. If God spoke to you, if God spoke to you, I want, I, want to, I want to open these altars. But I want you to come and say, God, you know what? Forgive me, God. Forgive me, forgive me for doing it my way, God. When I know that you're the only way. So God spoke to you. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. And let's sing the song. But these altars are open. You come. You say, God, you know what? I, I need you. I need you in my life. I'm not saying that we're back. I'm not saying that we don't have God. I'm not saying that we don't believe. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that we need to say, God, you know what? I, I just need a, I just need a, a new reference point. I need a new start. So God spoke to you, man. These altars are open. Let's sing this song. Let's lift up our voices. Lift up our hands, amen, as we worship God.